Obama, we are joined now by Virgil Roberts with the African American Board Leadership Institute. He was able to watch that with us. Uh, Mr. Roberts, I have to ask you the first thing that jumped off of my, jumped at me when President, former President Obama was speaking was he was talking about the things he's seen over the last few weeks are greater than anything he's seen. And this is from the first African American president uh, we've had in this yeah. country. It's remarkable to hear him say that. Well, what he says is true for everybody, whether you're African American or not. The, the we're living in, in an age that nobody alive has seen. Uh, we've got pandemic, we've got a business depression, and we have a renewed movement that's broader than the civil rights movement. It really is an, a movement against racism in America. It's really pretty remarkable for all three of those things to be converging at the same time at this moment in, in history. Mm. Mr. Rob, Mr. Roberts, they announced today, the Attorney General in Minnesota announced today that the three other officers involved in the George Floyd killing uh, would be charged, or they were charged, with aiding and abetting murder. And they also increased uh, from third degree to second degree the charges against former officer Chauvin. What are you, what's your reaction to that? My reaction is that that's, that seems to be appropriate. You know, um, I haven't done any criminal law in... 35, 40 years, but the videotapes, and it's a new videotapes that emerged, make it pretty clear that one, we had uh, a police officer who seemed to be very calmly choking someone to death. We saw that in the first videos. The videos that have been re have revealed since then show another two officers actually on the decedent's back. So not only was he being choked, but he also was being compressed with pressure on his back that prevented him to breathe uh, when he clearly was not in any sort of danger. Uh, I've heard some police officers talking to NPR who said the time had long passed where you had that adrenaline rush. You have one police officer kind of looking at the crowd with his hand in his pocket. The other police officers sort of helping him to squeeze life out of Mr. Floyd. And that simply is not the behavior that we would expect, especially from police officers who are there to protect and serve. They clearly were executing the man on the street. That is just unacceptable. And as you see and these you crowds gather in peaceful protest, um, hoping, so many people hoping that out of this great tragedy, something great will happen. And I feel like that's what I took from the first comments that President Obama was making, where he's talking about the very real opportunity for change here. Um, you, would, you don't want it to come from tragedy, but are you inspired by the way that people are protesting and the joy that is coming so, from so many of these rallies? Well, I am inspired by the way that people are protesting. You know, democracy is not a spectator sport. Hmm. Democracy is a participation sport. Uh, and I like to think that the activity and action that we see on the streets will be translated into the polls and the ballot box in November. The way a democracy works is the people, if we're going to govern ourselves, we have to take on the responsibility of understanding the kind of nation we want to live in. And what I'm seeing in the reactions that are going on spontaneously around the country is really a reaction to the economic inequality and racism in our society. And we have people of all ages, all races, all genders, uh, all, 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 all ages across the great American expanse saying things must change. And I hope and believe that come November, we will begin to see change taking place in our society. Look, every, every change that has taken place over the years, if you're, if you're a student of history, going back to the Boston Tea Party, it started with people in the streets saying, we are being treated unfairly, mm -hmm. and we need to change the way in which this system is operating. Uh, and it's happened time and again. 
And it wasn't just changes for, uh, for black folks. We had the Whiskey Rebellion. We've had lots and lots of actions. We had labor movements. Now, we had the suffragettes. Americans historically have taken to the streets, and it's always been the precursor of change and progress in our political system. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned the November elections, but how do we ensure, I mean, that's five months away, how do we ensure that the fever and the momentum remains through November and that people actually turn out to vote? Well, what, what I hope is that people who are going through the, the marches and the protests now, that there's something inside them that has changed. There's something that's made people get up off their sofa. There's a young man you interviewed earlier who said he was out here from Florida. He was sitting on his sofa and he was watching and he said, I thought, what am I going to tell my children when they say, Daddy, what did you do back in 2020 to make a difference? And I like to believe that that same sort of conclusion that that young man came to, that millions of other Americans will come to the same conclusion and come November, realize that if we're going to create the country we want to live in, we can't do it sitting on our sofa. We've got to get up and go out, take up the ballot, and vote to get people in office who represent the vision of America that we share. And Mr. Roberts, how do you hold the next round of elected officials responsible for this moment? If they're given that opportunity and they're elected, and then, then what? How do you hold them accountable to make sure they do that systemic change that we want to see happen? <laughs> We have uh, demonstrated now, if they don't do what they've been elected to do, we know we, that we have the option of going back to the streets, one, and two, or them uh, accountable at the next election. Uh, uh, look, look, for democracy to work, we can't say, okay, I voted, I turned my back, and I'm going back to sitting on the sofa in life as, as it has always been. It is an ongoing participation that we have to continue. And if we have to show up in the halls of Congress, if we have to show up in downtown LA, if we have to show up in Sacramento, to put pressure on our elected officials to do what we believe the right thing is that they should do, that is what we as citizens must do. Uh, in the earlier days of the, in the first days of the protesters, we did see some criminal elements uh, in, Derailing the effort, the peaceful protesters' efforts. Um, can you comment on what a change we've seen in the last couple of days? Well, I think the change we've seen is, is really remarkable, and I think it, it points to how people are learning as, as we go forward. In the early days, I think the folks who were the looters and the provocateurs were taking advantage of an opportunity to kind of use the protest marches as camouflage for the activities that they sought to engage in. You know, people would show up with bowling balls and bats and hammers, not because they intended to do anything except to break windows. I think we have to give some credit to uh, law enforcement officials recognizing that the overwhelming majority of folks were marching and they wanted to be peaceful. The curfews, wait, uh, the curfews work because a lot of the looting and violence took place once the sun went down and the peaceful protesters went home. The fact that the police have recognized what is going on with the provocateurs and have actually been protecting peaceful marchers and pro uh, protecting those who are protesting what they think the government needs to do to change, I think is really, again, it is really heartening to see that our elected officials, that our police departments are really supporting the efforts of citizens to peacefully uh, uh, petition their governments for change. And I think that the effect has been to isolate those provocateurs and those looters who have no interest in uh, protesting and working for change to make it clear that they're not us that they represent a very small fringe element. And by isolating them, we have taken away their power and their ability to disrupt. Yeah. 
And Mr. Roberts, I would add to everything you said that it almost shows to me the sustainability of the movement yeah. because they were not going to, the protesters right now were not going to be derailed by people who were not out there with their message either. I've seen them self-police. They don't want this. Don't want it. You know, uh, it, it's really, it's really an important moment uh, in American history when you think about the numbers of people who take into the streets. You know, you're in Los Angeles. We're in Los Angeles. We're covering things here, but people are taking the streets in little towns like Visalia and McFarland. I mean, little small, small communities where there is no television coverage. All across America, what we're seeing is people recognizing that our country is on the wrong track and there's a desire to get it back on the right track. Yeah. America has never been perfect. You know, we've been striving for the 250 years of our existence and try to create a more perfect union. And we have, by and large, slowly, incrementally become successful at doing that. Remember, when the country was started, the only people who could vote were white men with property. And then it was expanded to white, all white men. Then it was expanded to the newly freed enslaved black men. Then it was expanded to women. Then we had a Voting Rights Act that did away with a lot of the, um, the, the barriers to voting for, for, for black folks in the South and elsewhere. So there's been a continual movement and always it's made the country more inclusive. It's made it better. We have unleashed the power of all sorts of folks who were, who were stepped on, women, gays, blacks. We brought all of them slowly into the mainstream. That's the arc of America. That's the building of a more perfect union. And what we're seeing now is millions of Americans taking to the street to say, our job is not finished. And we're here to protest to make sure that the job of building the kind of society we want continues anew. Man, that's uh, I, we wish we could talk with you. We wish we could continue our conversation with you. You're so informative and such a pleasure to speak to. But I just want to ask you one last thing, because we've seen several law enforcement officers take a knee at these protests, uh, holding the hands of protesters seemingly really understanding what these protesters have been going through and their message. Can you add to any of that? What is your take on that? Well, policemen are people too. And I think one of the big changes we've seen here in LA, you know, 28 years ago, we had a riot uh, around the police beatings of Rodney King. From that date until now, there has been a tremendous effort made to reform the Los Angeles Police Department. And so we now have people in that department who really represent the people that they are policing. And because they represent the people that they are policing, they have an empathy and understanding of what people want. That's what we want from our police force. People who, uh, who understand, yes, we're gonna fight crime. We're gonna lock up looters. We're gonna lock up the fifth columnists. We're gonna lock up the provocateurs. But for those of you who want our country to be a better place, we are joined at the hip with you and we protest also. You couldn't ask for a better show of how our police department in LA has reformed itself and is part of making our community a better place and moving in that direction that I talked about, a more perfect union. Virgil Roberts, thank you very much. I mean, thank you. I love how you thank put you it all into, uh, into such, uh, such a great thought. Uh, thank you for your time.